Welcome everybody to the PSC webinar with Ubertricity. Um, we'll just wait one minute for people to join. Give us a second and then we'll kick off. Okay, right, I think we should um, go for it. Hopefully you can all hear me uh, well. Uh, my name is Toby Butler. I'm the Managing Director of Ubertricity. Um, thank you very much for joining this webinar. Uh, we're going to be focusing on value for money with a particular look into uh, when it comes to funding and financing strategies for EV charge points, what's the best way to go about that? Um, and I think this topic of value for money uh, and the different ways to fund and finance EV strategies is just is on so many people's minds. It's occupying so much so much time. Uh, I know that in the local authorities that I talk to, for example, you know a lot of them are very deep into all of the Levi applications um, and going through that. So I think more people are joining now. Um, but yeah, let's let's properly kick off. So. Um, yeah, so today we'll be, like I said, we'll be talking about value for money, funding and financing. Uh, we have got two fantastic guests to help us with this, proper experts in their field. Uh, we have Juliet Flamanc from uh, Green Finance Institute, and we have Mark Cooper from Ubertristi. I'll let them introduce themselves properly in a minute. So uh, there, I'm here to just keep the conversations and the questions flowing. They're here to give you some real expertise and insight into this topic. Um, now, we're going to structure the session where we'll have up front, we'll have 40, 45 minutes of discussion and questions with them and hearing from them. And then hopefully as we go, uh, you'll all be asking questions. So at the bottom of the screen, there should be an ask your question button. So please just keep asking your questions and we'll try and get through as many as possible. That's maybe where the biggest value of this is in hearing what's on your mind and you know understanding that and then hopefully addressing those. And if we don't get to all of them, we'll try to get back to you with answers um, afterwards. There is also a live chat button but it's a bit difficult for us to follow that. So if you make sure you post your questions and ask your question, that would be great. So maybe I just start by asking um, Juliet and Mark to introduce themselves. So Juliet, do you want to go first? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much. Um, so morning, everyone. I'm Juliet Flamanc. I'm the Charging Infrastructure Lead at the Green Finance Institute. Um, for those that don't know, about much about the Green Finance Institute, we were set up in 2019 as a direct response to a key policy recommendation that was made to the UK government in the first Green Finance Strategy. And essentially, we sit between the public and private sector. We look at different sectors, so hence my area of focus is charging infrastructure. We look at different sectors to understand what is the opportunities in these sectors and what are the current barriers to investment in this space and what financial solutions can we design to really encourage you know the rate of deployment of private investment to speed up yeah very pleased to be talking to you all today thank you very much julia and i know that you're you've you haven't been feeling brilliant and your voice is a bit like up and down so uh I, we really appreciate you joining with us and hope that your voice lasts the duration um thank you uh and over to you mark Hi everyone, I'm Mark Cooper. I'm the Technical Business Development Manager for Ubertricity. Uh, I actually sit alongside three of our key departments. So I assist all of our area sales managers with regard to technical questions and everything from members of the public, from local authorities, uh, from, from interested party stakeholders in the EV industry that we work in. I also work alongside our operations teams, solving any technical problems that they come across. And the third and final aspect of kind of what I do is actually uh, working with our product development teams to make sure that we are creating the products that meet the challenges of the new technical uh, um, regulations and standards that are coming to the market. 
uh, one of my big roles with our sales team is to actually work with our tender team so answering all the technical questions across tenders and public procurement that comes in so i see a lot of public procurement documents and tenders and work alongside those teams to help answer and respond to them great thanks yeah so you got two experts in areas which i think are very important you know to all of us whether you're in a local authority um, or other organizations so uh, around the financing side and around the technical and product side um, so why don't we uh, put the first poll up uh, which is just seeing like how you all feel about uh, your knowledge of financing and funding and seeing we've got what the range of knowledge is and then we can try and hopefully pitch some of the content at that so if we could shoot the first poll that would be great i don't know whether i'll see it pop up i don't see it yet yeah it's there it's there okay brilliant all right okay um and while we're waiting for those results to come in um so uh just a quick introduction in case you, in case uh some of you haven't heard of ubertristi i'll just give you the few seconds intro um so we're a charge point operator we exist primarily for those people who cannot um park off street and have their own home charger which in our major cities is the majority of the inhabitants or residents we think evs should be open to everyone and that Everybody should have convenient, easy, uh, good value charging available to them. And so that's why you see we've rolled out uh, over 7,700 charge points across the UK. Most of those are our lamppost chargers, but we do a whole range from AC, DC, et cetera. So we are passionate about yeah access for everybody, ease of owning an EV for everyone, not just those who can uh, have if you like almost like the luxury of their own home charge point on their own driveway um okay so let's see so we've got a good mix in the poll i can see um uh yeah we've got so the majority of people 55 percent i'm not familiar with the funding options for local authorities and then 37 percent of a basic understanding and and only eight percent say I'm confident in my understanding. Um, maybe those results will change a bit more. But OK, that shows you're on the right call then, because um, that's what we're here to do um, with Mark and Juliet is to try to fill some of those knowledge gaps. And, you know, it is it is a complex, fast moving area. Um, so that's great to see that there's a mix of knowledge. But, you know, really, it seems like the majority of people really want to understand uh, more. So. Fantastic. So maybe just to kick off, um, um, Juliet, can you tell us, you know, what funding is currently available to UK local authorities for EV infrastructure projects? Maybe just walk us through the different types of funding with some of their key characteristics and requirements. Yeah, absolutely. So I kind of, I'm going to split it into two sections. So First, you've got the government grant funding. So the two here are the uh, Local Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Fund, the Levi Fund, and then also uh, the AUX funding, which is the uh, on-street residential charge point scheme. Next section, I talked, I'll talk about options that local authorities can take out where they um, sort the funding themselves, but let's focus on the two grants for now. So I'll start with Levi because I think this is the most topical one and probably the one that you know, we imagine most of the questions will be about. So Levi is designed to support local authorities in England to work with the charge point industry to improve the rollout and commercialization of local charging. So the real focus for the fund is that these public charge points will help residents who don't have off street parking and need to charge their EVs. So I've kind of mentioned two of the, you know, the, the key aims for Levi there. So that step change in deployment of um, local power, especially for those without off street parking, and then that commercialization point. And I think those two, whenever you read any documents or guidance on Levi, you can really see those two you know, 
aims throughout. So the fund is split into two parts. You've got the capital funding, which is the bulk of the funding. That's about 350 million. Now, what's different about Levi versus AUKS and then just some other government grants you know, for other sectors is that this is available to and allocated to tier one local authorities in England. So for those that don't know, most other grants, you have to submit an application, you have to bid for. This is actually the, you know, the 350 million of capital funding has just been allocated to tier one local authorities. And the capital funding is just for, you know, actually the installation of the infrastructure. There's another pot, which is then the capacity fund, very similar names. I tend to just call it the, the revenue funding if anyone else like me gets confused with that. And that is much smaller. That's about 40 million, which provides revenue funding to local authorities, you know, to hire dedicated EV officers. So I think what we hear a lot, and obviously, you know, really keen to see this through in the questions, is actually you know often local authorities you know don't have the um dedicated resource actually able to you know work on the ev strategy and work on these you know, tenders for hiring a cpo to come and build out the infrastructure so that pot was really intended to be able to hire those dedicated ev officers and um, if you keep if you watch um announcements out of ozev and the other levi support bodies you will see that there is some training coming as well for those dedicated EV officers. But maybe thinking a bit more, focusing on that capital funding now, the bit about you know, the actual building out the infrastructure. So and focusing on that second um, key aim about commercialization. So it was made very clear to local authorities um, that you know one of the big one of the big desires of Levi is that it's to help secure further investment to support the development of a more self-sufficient local charge point market and when we think about <clears throat> therefore what is the um what's kind of the, the the scope as i mentioned earlier the other aim is to help those without off-street parking so lower powered you know less than 22 kilowatt charge points are kind of the focus and must form you know the majority of the funding so when you think about any conditions on it, that's definitely a key one to remember. Now, higher powered charge points you know, will also be considered, but that key word of the lower powered has to be the majority. Maybe just um, an update in terms of where we are. So Toby and you know, Mark already mentioned earlier that you know, there are lots of local authorities who are you know, preparing their tenders at the moment. So whatever they've been allocated of that 350 million, they will you know, be putting out a tender to hire a, you know, a CPO, a service provider, to come in and you know, deploy charging infrastructure in their local area. But an update for those that didn't know was that in um, August last year, there was 10 million awarded to nine local authorities for a pilot scheme. Now, this was actually expanded by an additional 22 million in February earlier this year. And what was great was that this secured 17 million of private investment. So coming back to that, you know, other big aim of Levi about, you know, can we accelerate the commercialization of, you know, can we secure further investment, you know, to support a self-sufficient um, market? You know, the pilot was a great example that there absolutely is private capital out there, you know, that would really, really wants to come in and be involved in this. And, you know, the pilot showed us that. Appreciate I've been speaking quite a lot on Levi, so maybe just, and I know there'll be lots of questions on it. So maybe just the final point to say is that, you know, for anyone that hasn't seen it, we we'll definitely go and have a look at the documents that have been published by the support body that go into a bit more detail on you know, the scope and scale. I think I just called out some of the um, you know, high level points for you there. But for example, the heads of terms document that goes through key contract terms and has a Levi recommendation for each one. So, for example, recommended contract lengths of about 15 years. You know, that's a great example of what else you'll see in the heads of terms. Um, I think we'll stop there on, on Levi. Very happy to go straight um, into Orcs or Toby. Were there any other points you wanted me to mention on Levi? Um, I think, well, maybe just a, a question from your point of view. I mean, lots of local authorities are in the whole process, but, uh, you know, what's your, what's your take on overall how it's going? Because it's critical, isn't it? You know, it's a critical mm -hmm. government push and strategy to open up EV charging to sort of everybody and try to accelerate. So just, yeah, just interested in how you see things going um, at this, at this 
I suppose, early stage in the Levi applications? I think no. I think that's, that's that's a great question. I mean, for those that probably weren't aware, you know, there there have been some delays to the Levi process, um, and you know, a lot of you know what what's kind of made that happen is because you know, we've realised that there needed to be a lot more work on you know that guidance and working with local authorities. So that's why you know we've made a real effort to put out all of those documents, such as the heads of terms, and there's another one called the technical schedules and one all about how to evaluate tenders. And that's kind of been you know, some of the delays that we've seen is really making sure that we put the time in you know, before the tenders went out to try and get every local authority you know, to, to the same place. I think, I think it is going really, really well. There are some incredible people working on this you know, from the support body. You've got um, Cenex and um, Energy Savings Trust and PA Consulting. Um, it has definitely been what we are seeing is quite a range in local authorities in terms of you've got ones who have done lots of EV charging infrastructure already under AUKS or just under other schemes and then there are some that this is really quite new for them and you know it's because of those local authorities that we've had to, you know that we've wanted to spend more time you know, before the tenders go out. Um, maybe something else to flag as well is on the commercial arrangements so Levi has said that there are different commercial arrangements that local authorities can choose. You've got your own and operate model. Um, you've got then more of the concession model, which is where you know you bring in CPOs and you have revenue shares, et cetera. Or then you've got a land lease model. Now that's quite a range there. And although we're seeing the bulk of local authorities, you know, center in that middle bit in that concession, obviously we've wanted to make sure that there's guidance for you know, everyone across it. So I think it's going really well. I think the idea to to allocate the funding has been fantastic um, so that there's not just been, you know, the I think there are local authorities who then have needed to kind of get up to speed on what charging infrastructure is and how to approach it. And at least they know that they've been allocated this money. They didn't need to bid for it. Um, I'm really excited to see the tenders go out next year. Yeah, great. I think from... From our side, we do see uh, a big effort, you know, sort of coordinated by OZEV to try to incorporate all of the feedback from CPOs as well. You know, it's just Levi covers so many different, you know, the, the heads of terms and the guidance has to cover everything from technical to legal to contractual to, you know, it's on and on and on. So it's a complex beast, but I do see it coming together. And yeah, you know, us and I'm sure all the other CPOs, we are really looking forward to seeing those first tenders of the main Levi kind of funding. Um, but yeah, Juliet, so you, so, okay, so that, that was Levi. So do you want to move on to the other, the other options for local authorities? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So then the other um, grant funding, that comes from OZEV that local authorities have been able to access over the last few years um, is AUKS, so the uh, on-street residential charge point scheme. Now this allowed local authorities to access grant funding to part fund the procurement and installation of on-street EV charging infrastructure, uh, especially for residential needs. So just like with Levi, there's been you know, some conditions over who you know the majority of the charging infrastructure needed to be for, you know, this again was very focused on residential needs. There were <clears throat> amendments made earlier on this year to ensure that more local authorities, you know, can benefit from the funding. So those changes included, um, now the scheme would provide up to a maximum of 50,000 of project capital costs. When it first rolled out, that percentage was a bit higher. So what's been really great, and this has been a good learning experience through Levi, is that OZEV have been really able to see, you know, the amount of you know, demand there is out there from, you know, from the private sector. And that's why that proportion of public capital has been able to go down for orgs and why we expect it in Levi to be, you know, much lower than, than that even. So that was a change that you know, maximum of 50%. And um, also grants then were capped at 200,000. Um, and grant, they can exceed 7,500 7, per charge point. So more conditions um, on the actual cost per charge point on the AUX side than with Levi. Um, so AUX will remain open to applications until March next year or until all the funding has been allocated, kind of whichever is sooner. So any local authority who would really like to still get some AUX funding before they use their 
allocated Levi part, perhaps that's because they're in the tranche two Levi, you know, we'll definitely encourage you to um, make sure that you get your applications in soon, given the deadlines. So I think those are the two, you know, main um, in terms of government grants. And there's definitely some others, some other source of funding I'd love to speak on. But again, just maybe to see Toby if there were any questions on AUKS or if I should keep going. Um, I think I think maybe keep going and then we'll pick up Great. some questions uh, afterwards. Yeah, please do. Brilliant. So then the next kind of section is about other sources of funding that local authorities, you know, can go out and get themselves. There's three to kind of touch on the first one is uh, a local climate bond also called a community municipal investment so a cmi depending you might have heard it two different two different words but i'll call it a local climate bond going forward so this is a regulated investment product launched by local authorities to access cost effective funding for specific decarbonization projects so something to flag is that, you know, although there are lots of local climate bonds out there, they're not, you know, always for EV charging infrastructure, though they have been you know, seen to be used and can work very well. So a local climate bond offers residents the opportunity to invest in their local area through a crowdfunding platform from as little as five pounds. The instrument represents an opportunity to kind of tap into a new source of capital, you know, local resident savings. So based on public data from um, ONS, it's estimated that on average for every 100,000 people in the UK, there's you know, 4 billion of cash and capital held, but this money tends to you know, flow out of local communities. So local climate bonds allow you know, to be invested locally, you know, further, further in community wealth building and helping to bridge the funding gap for local councils. So the GFI in partnership with Abundance and UK 100, Innovate UK and local partnerships launched the local climate bond campaign in 2021 to raise awareness of this you know, extra funding opportunity for local authorities. So to date, we've had you know, eight councils from across the UK issue a local climate bond. They've raised over six million for local green projects and have had almost 2000 investors participate in a local climate bond. And as I mentioned up top, you know, not every council has used it for EV charging. You know, there are other decarbonisation projects, but examples of councils that have are uh, Islington, Camden, uh, Cotswolds and Lewisham. Um, so we definitely recommend you know, if anyone is a resident in any of those places, you know, to maybe go and have a look to see if they're still open and you can tap into the local climate bond. Um, but that's for how a local authority can kind of raise another source. I think one that probably most will already be aware of is the Public Works Loan Board. So this is then a way, this is a lending facility that local authorities you know, can, can borrow from for capital projects. I think it, Public Works Loan Board accounts for something like 75% of long, local authority long-term borrowing. There is still some remaining capacity in the um, statutory limit of the Public Works Loan Board. So I think there are probably lots of local authorities on the call that have, you know, actually taken some funding from there before but a newer option as well which is actually a little bit cheaper than public works loan board is from the uk infrastructure bank so the uk infrastructure bank's local authority lending solutions they have about four billion to lend to local authorities for eligible infrastructure projects and they offer 50-year loans currently at um about 40 40 basis points lower than Public Works Loan Board. So just know that they're you know, a bit cheaper. Um, however, their minimum loan size is 5 million. Um, they can finance local authority led infrastructure projects across you know, any of the UK infrastructure bank's mandate, which includes transport and therefore EV charging uh, infrastructure you know, sits really nicely in that. So any local authority that has taken out a Public Works Loan Board who is you know, thinking of taking out more would definitely recommend that they go and look at the UK Infrastructure Bank's pro uh, uh, products there because they said they are cheaper um, and they've got a lot to give away. I think that probably summarises yeah. everything from my side. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Juliet. I mean, that's I hadn't actually been aware of the local climate bond. That sounds really interesting. And like you said, you know, I think in this industry we. We're very focused on Levi and then on Orcs. So it's great to hear that actually there are even more options available um, for local authorities. That's really good to hear. Um, there are 
there are a few questions which we could maybe just uh, take a few of them. Um, so, um, Mark, I don't know. Maybe I can turn to you or or, or Juliet if um, if it's more for you. But so there's one uh, which is on, you know, a par asking does a parish council can a parish council sort of be included as a local authority when it comes to this funding? And there's a question about a parish council with a playing field, car park, uh, well placed for a couple of destination charges, might need a supply upgrade. Yeah, would they be able to claim for a grant? So uh, I'm going to jump in quickly. Obviously, a lot of this uh, Levi funding was aimed at tier one local authorities. So that would be the counties, metropolitan boroughs, et cetera, and above. Um, so it doesn't include parish councils directly. However, they can join up with their districts and county councils and become part of that funding arrangement. So, you know, please talk to the registered highway authorities, the, the transport planners, etc., at county level and the district level, and you may well be able to uh, promote your particular locations and work with them to gain access to some of that Levi funding. Um, if they've not already identified, they may well be looking for particular car parks or areas that they, you know, they, they want to put EV charges in. So please work collaboratively with the local authorities in your area that they have access to the Levi funding. Independent to that, I'm sure parish councils are also able to access AUKS funding, and I'm hoping Juliet can come firm that but i think they're able to access AUKS funding uh, and there are those other sources of funding that julia mentioned and uh, some of those may well be applicable as well so i'll kind of hand over to julia if she wants to confirm any of that or just put me right <laughs> no no i definitely yeah I've, I've, everything you've said there um definitely on on levi advice um AUKS funding yes i think at some point parishes were able to though as i mentioned in my section there were these changes in 2023 that did amend some of the conditions so i would actually just recommend going onto the gov.uk website for it they've got really clear helpful pages where they kind of have um you know availability you know and eligibility etc so we definitely look at that um i've just seen i can definitely help answer some of the other questions that i've seen pop up about local climate bonds um it is an investment obviously from residents. So the, the question is if it needs to be repaid. What we've actually found is that lots of local residents don't collect their annual interest because they view it as like you know, an investment in their community. Obviously we don't advise the local authorities to you know, plan on that basis. Um, but it's actually been a really nice kind of um, thing to have seen that actually residents don't tend to collect on that. But um, yes, the idea is that there is um, you know, an eventual repayment back just in the same way that other products might work. But um, yeah, there has been that nice learning that actually residents don't tend to claim on it. Um, they would definitely implore you to go look at, on the GFI's website. We have a whole uh, toolkit, which is uh, brand new, actually only launched this month, um, that can help advise anyone looking to launch one of these. And then the questions around where to find all the guidance documents to Levi, if you go on to Senex's website, um, they have a section where the three big documents I'd recommend are the heads of terms, the technical schedules, and then the evaluation guidance as well. Great, thanks for that. And then maybe there's a quick one here about sort of schools and academy trusts. Are they can th can they access funding, or what access could they potentially fund? Um, at the, yeah. Uh that's a really good question. I think the same answer applies about Levi, um, for sure. And again, on Orcs, I, 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 I actually did don't know on that one. Whereas parishes, I did have a previous. I, I would recommend going to have a look on on the website for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, and maybe we can get back after this. Um, all right. So, um, okay. So we heard a lot about all of the different um, funding available uh, from government. Um, and other funding mechanisms. Um, and we know that, as you know, especially with Levi, Juliet, like you said, this is all about maximizing as well what, you know, what local authorities uh, can gain from private funding, um, from commercial funding. So maybe, Mark, um, yeah, from a CPO perspective, so charge point oper 
operator perspective, like Ubertricity, um, what is available from the CPOs for local local authorities in terms of funding? So for perhaps some of those smaller projects where they're not able to gain access to AUKS funding or um, Levi, or maybe they're, they're looking to just do some pilot schemes or something like that, uh, there is opportunities for fully funded models from a CPO. So we would invest all of the money uh, and work with the local authority, the, the applicant, to ensure that we identified correct locations and work with them to, to roll out the pilot scheme or the smaller scheme or the, whether it's filling in some gaps or something from previous projects. So we would work with them as a fully funded project. Because we're investing that money, generally the contract length is a little bit longer and we kind of look at utilisation rates perhaps a little bit more. Whereas uh, with Levi or uh, AUKS funding, we kind of match funding the grant stuff that, 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 is, uh, that is available from central government um, and maybe uh, investing over the top where it's appropriate um, for those funds. But for, yeah, so um, fully funded solutions from CPOs are definitely available. Um, and uh, we, we more than happily discuss those with, with the right sort of applicants and the right projects, but obviously uh, we're obviously looking to maximise the, the potential, of, but also help you and and uh, to try these these technologies out so that you can then be confident when you make your full scale application that you already kind of know um, what you're letting yourself in for and what technologies work and, and how the CPO can assist you because we are there to help. Uh, we can help you with the applications for AUKS funding or, or uh, assist you with identifying data points and network planning for your larger scale uh, Levi funding. So, yeah, we're, we're there to help. Yeah. And I think the great thing about um, especially the Levi fund is it's all, you know, I see that it's been designed to test how much commercial investment can be gained for a particular project. So it's not like, you know, um, Juliet, correct, correct me if I'm wrong, it's not like there is a set percentage, you know, where it has to be this split. So this EV infrastructure project on the terms of Levi needs to be 70% funded, I don't know, let's say by the government, 30% uh, by the commercial sector, CPOs. It is more is a, a mechanism just to test the maximum value the local authority can get for that project and how to maximize the commercial investment. So I think that it, it's set up really well to, to try to maximize that. Um, yeah, I think just, just to come in there, that's, that is exactly right. And you know, when I mentioned orcs, you know, there are you know, previous schemes where there have been more you know, set percentages. And it was really great to see the changes to orcs earlier this year, where it was actually recognized that that percentage of public funding, you know, not only could come down, but to make it clear that that was also like a maximum. I think in the past there's been experience of, you know, with AUKS, well, it was 75%. We will just go and ask for 25% from private and that's it. When actually throughout the process of Levi, when we've spoken to some local authorities and we've said, well, when you were doing AUKS, did you ever, did you ever ask the question if they had more appetite than the 25%? And some were like, no, because we, we we didn't need to ask that question, so we so we didn't, and it's definitely been a really great learning experience, I think, to see that, and it's great to see that you know reflected in Levi that there isn't that maximum anymore. Yeah, yeah, great, and I suppose this brings us on nicely to if the two aspects you know that I really see in Levi, one is how can you maximise. Uh, investment from the commercial sector to really accelerate the growth of EV infrastructure, especially in, you know, for the, for the lower powered EV infrastructure for people who don't have their own home charge points. And the other one is, I think, the value for money, you know, so re really making sure and testing the market that the local authority is getting the best possible value for money. It's th This is the way that the whole EV charging sector is going to grow up and become a properly established sector, you know, with really high standards, high levels of reliability, um, and really good value for local authorities and residents. But maybe what we do just to begin this is, um, if we can put the poll up, um, 
So the poll here, so we're, go, we're, go, we're, we're asking you, what's the best way to calculate value for money in EV charging projects? Um, and yeah, just put down what your, your thoughts are, the, the choices are, is it about the total number of charge points? So should you be uh, going for, you know, just, uh, you know, this project gives me X number of charge points, it's the maximum, therefore it's the best value. Should it be the total power output? of the charge points? Um, or should it be something about the total number of charge points, you know, times by the average power of the charge points? Uh, what What are your thoughts? And and I think it's, you know, this isn't a, it's not clear cut. Everybody's learning the best way uh, to calculate value for money. Um, but thanks, so everybody's answering those. So maybe while we do that, um, maybe Mark, if I can turn to you and, just, you know, what are some of your thoughts on the different areas that local authorities can really demonstrate that they're looking for value for money in their Levi applications? And, and what are the areas you think, you know, in Levi applications, a local authority needs to get right to make sure they get the best value for money from the CPOs that they're engaged with? I think one of the things uh, really that we very heavily concentrate on is making sure that we don't just specify a particular speed or a particular type of charge point or, or whatever. It, that, you know, it really does require a good mix of hardware uh, across a large geographical region, uh, and those charges need to be the right type of charger, the right speed, in the right location um, to match the, the need of the users in, in, in that particular area. So if you think about um, a, 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 an on-street charger, normally the car is parked up outside your house overnight. It's just sat there empty doing nothing. So why not plug it into a standard speed column charger so when you wake up in the morning it's fully charged uh, obviously there are going to be locations where we need higher power chargers uh, perhaps in the town center where a 22 kilowatt might be more appropriate in a car park because you might be parked up for two or three hours or, or slightly longer while you're doing the weekly shop or, or whatever it may be doing or you know we've gone out for the uh, for the evening and and gone for a meal or and a cinema so your car's parked up for three or four hours so a 22 kilowatt charger might be more appropriate than those solutions um for us obviously we would always say think of a lamppost can it be used you know they're sat there they are an existing asset that most local authorities own and operate uh, and maintain, um, why not try and turn them into something that can create a bit of revenue for you? Um, it's easier and cheaper to convert a, um, a lamppost, an existing lamppost, than it is to put a new charger on street with all the infrastructure that has to go with that. Um, and uh, obviously the, the changes to the street scene that that might uh, in, uh, involve. Whereas obviously with column charges, we're obviously attaching to those existing assets, so we're not we're not adding anything else to the street scene. We want to make sure that obviously for value for money, that as many charges as possible are open to as many people as possible. So there's two ways of thinking about that. One, using very open infrastructure, uh, something that doesn't require an app to log into something that doesn't require another special equipment or something that's open to all and available to all whether they're residents or passing through or whatever it may be so that everything is there um, and equally uh, something that's applicable to a wider spread of vehicles and across a larger geographical area you know we don't want to see just the city centers get in this investment. It needs to be more widespread across a larger geographical, a geographical area so that we're allowing residents to make that choice and move to electric vehicles if they haven't already got them. You know, just because they don't have off-street parking doesn't mean that they shouldn't have access to these vehicles and the convenience of being able to charge outside their own house. Um, so 
Don't just look at the city centres where we know we're going to get a high utilisation. Look at those more outlying areas. Let's look at areas where people are considering moving to EVs. Um, but maybe the infrastructure needs to go there first and realise, you know, we as a CPO, realise that utilisation rates aren't going to be great initially. But if you kind of build it, they will grow. It will develop. We all know it's the right thing to do. Uh, but we need to make sure the infrastructure is spread across so that there is no area left behind. Thanks, Mark. Um, yeah, and that's definitely something, you know, at Ubertristi, we're in this for the long term. Um, you know, and I think all of the CPOs that are really understand this business and sector, you have to take a long term view as EVs grow. Um, so the polls have uh, come in and most people have opted for C. So that's total number of charge point times average power of charge points. And I mean, this I think it was a bit of a, a bit of a uh, tough poll because there isn't really a 100 percent right answer. I think and one of the things I think is interesting is uh, option C might be the best of the three, but it still leaves out a lot, you know, because value for money. I think actually it has so many different aspects. So there's one about um, ensuring that even if you get this sort of total number of charge point times average power of charge, that are those charge points, it's still got to be the right use case. You know, it's still got to be the right infrastructure for that particular use case. Plus, it needs to be reliable, you know, plus it, you know, and needs to be maintained you need to think about the value to the residents as well and what the end pricing is going to be and how that is going to be managed so that i think there are many there are many aspects to this and i i think the the useful thing from the poll is to actually say probably it goes beyond one simple calculation um but juliet like building on that what do you th do you think there's one simple calculation like a, or maybe a slightly more complex one than this or do you think it's many factors like how do we deal with value for money how do we think about it maybe in terms of levi specifically because i think that's on everyone's mind uh in a way that is sort of helpful and manageable you know not too complex yeah i think it's a, a great question and um i mean in short I don't think there is a, a one calculation. I mean, that that's something that we've definitely discussed a lot. You know, when putting out the, um, putting out all of the advice documents, because I think it builds on you know the two points that Mark said there around thinking about use case and then about portfolio of sites. So we definitely you know really encourage you know thinking about right charges in the right place, and that's why when we've kind of advised on. How to evaluate tenders we've not focused on you know the absolute number of charge points and instead you know we kind of have made we have our local authorities to think more about it's the scale of the solution of the um solution yes but it's not just absolute number of charge points it's also not just the the power delivered it's the use case it's thinking about where are the charge points going to be and then I think the other part that Mark touched on, which absolutely you know feeds into the advice that we've been giving, is about this portfolio of sites. So you know, and this is a bit more with my uh, GFI hat on now. You know, Levi does you know it marks like the last form of public subsidy that's going to be coming to local authorities for EV charging. You know, that's why one of the two aims of it is this commercialization of you know, the sector, and therefore. If finding where to target that public subsidy is really important. So we've been talking a lot about a portfolio approach. So identifying you know, exactly as Mark was saying, what are the sites that are you know, they're a community need? They might have lower utilization in the short term, but they absolutely need to be there to encourage drivers to transition in the long term. You know, those are the sites then that the subsidy should be focused on. And then you, know, you bundle in into your portfolio, you bundle in the sites that you know, will have higher utilization in the short term that don't need the subsidy to make it a commercial, you know, viable business case. So I think those two points, um, you know, whereas there's there's not, uh, there's absolutely not really one measure or, or one calculation. And instead it's this kind of encompassing points about what's the use case? Have you done a portfolio of sites? Where's the public subsidy targeted at? I think yeah, if I kind of, well, for me, what is the answer to you know, what's value for money and Levi? 
it's about you know creating this step change in building out infrastructure it's, it's creating you know, access to charging infrastructure for those that don't have you know off-street solutions it's about making the market more commercial it's about bringing in private investment so there's a lot there yeah there's lots of different things there but yeah i think mark mm-hmm. touched on the on the two big ones already on on use case and portfolios yeah thanks julia and there's a uh, you know there's a couple of comments and uh, questions i think you know uh mark fletcher has has sort of nailed it like saying that you know value for money is more complicated exactly what you're saying it's about subsidizing less commercially attractive sites and looking at reliability a uh, couple of things i would um just try to bring people's attention to as well on value for money is you know mark talked about existing infrastructure i do think if you're looking for slow charging it is five to ten times more cost effective to put a charger in a street light than it is to put an ac standalone 7 to 22 kilowatt charger and for long dwell times the speed of charging you get from the lamp post is absolutely you know it's perfect for that overnight or long duration parking in the day so please don't rule out lamppost chargers from Ubertristi or from our competitors. It's just, I think, for a particular use case, it's an excellent route to value for money. The other one is, if you're thinking about doing a calculation with power, 22 kilowatts, I would just be aware that very few cars take the full 22 kilowatts of AC charging. Most take between 7 and 11 kilowatts. And my final one, is uh sorry these are like bugbears that <laughs> my final one is revenue share so and, and maybe we can speak a bit more because there's a question on revenue share so obviously and a lot of you know uh, built into the levi fund um you know is guidance that um ev charging infrastructure can be an opportunity for local authorities to gain revenue from those assets on their street and, and my one thing would be that revenue share that money that would be passed back to local authority unfortunately it doesn't come from a magic pot of money it will eventually someone has to pay for it and the cpos need to be commercially viable so if you are aiming for an incredibly high revenue share the only way that can really work is by higher prices to the end consumer so i think revenue share is 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 great local authorities should be getting value but i do think there is a question about if you absolutely maximize it and score it as the most most important thing in the tenders i do worry and consumer prices i don't know juliet do you have any thoughts on that no i think i think that's a really really good point um and it's definitely why we've had lots of local authorities talk more about profit share as well because there's, you know, mm-hmm. yes, it recognizes that point that you get revenue by charging prices. But then I think there's an extra point to what you're saying there, Toby, about how, yes, you might be able to generate revenue in the short term, but, you know, obviously it's, it's cost a lot to install the infrastructure. Um, what's the viable biz- business model? And actually, therefore, profit share is maybe a bit more helpful in recognizing the fact that there's not um, there's not profits in the short term. Um, something else to maybe add on the tender point as well is how tariffs. Um, so we definitely you know, we don't want any commercial evaluation um, to be based on you know, the overall tariff um, because you know, we're keen for any tenders not to become a bidding war there. So there's definitely I think one of the third documents that I mentioned about evaluation advice. So how the advice that we've given to local authorities is there are kind of five considerations when evaluating a tender. So the, the first one is solution, and that should have you know the largest weighting. We've kind of given that an indicative weighting of about 50%. And that is you know, the overall approach and scale of the technical solution, which will be provided for the level of Levi subsidy. And so here you've got to think about what's the strategic fit. Um, yeah what's what's the scale of the solution really focusing on that on that use case point that we keep mentioning that it's not just scale in terms of absolute numbers but it's scale in terms of power and is it the right charges in the right place um it, so that's the main the main part of the valuation then we've also asked authorities to give to the next consideration is around 
delivery and this is about 15 percent we've advised so this is the, you know the approach to implement the proposed solution so here we've asked local authorities to think about installation program to, um, and like what's the risk management and how do they mitigate it there and then um, the next consideration and so this table is all absolutely in those documents that i've mentioned um, so you can definitely go find this um, but the next consideration is around operation. So what's the operational approach, you know, including maintenance and customer service of the proposed solution? Um, and that's about 15% as well. And I'd love to come back to that point in a second, but I'll just finish off the table. Um, then commercial. So then it's the appropriateness and sustainability of the proposed commercial model. And I think that's where we are hearing a bit about tariffs. So you know, making sure that that's why we don't want tariffs to be you know, in the actual evaluation because we don't want it to be just you know, who, who can bid the highest price or actually who can bid mm. the greatest revenue share because actually is that a sustainable business model it, it might not be and actually you you might see that some people you know bidding in to, to just just to win the tender so that's why that point there is all around is it sustainable and that's 10 percent and then the final 10 percent um, is on social value. So the wider social value, which will be delivered by the contracts. So hopefully that kind of gives you guys this view that there are lots of things that we want you to consider when thinking about, you know, evaluating the, the tenders. Yeah, thanks, Juliet. I think, um, I think it's going to be, it's going to be a fascinating, you know, one to two years as we come to, you know, the industry, the local authorities, the um the specialist consultancies and companies you know juliet like organizations um such as grief finance institute all push towards this way of working that you know that really delivers um but we got lots of good uh questions so we've got one we've got one question on ro road signs don't currently point to ev charge centers whereas they do for car parks does funding cover charging signs to show where ev charging is mark do you want to yeah I, I actually think that's a really interesting question and, and i kind of fully support and agree with this you know we have lots and lots of signage for car parking but uh and we know that car parks are going to be a target area for for ev chargers uh where it's appropriate uh so i really think that's a good question i don't think there's anything specific but I think you could class road signs as infrastructure. So I think if you were to talk to Senex and, and, and the like and say we would like to spend some money updating the existing signage that we have as well to indicate that there are EV charge points in these car parks, um, I think that would be a discussion they would probably welcome. And, and may well look at. Uh, I think it needs to be appropriate signage. It needs to be in line with TSGRD and uh, and and obviously meet all the requirements. Uh, I think it's 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 something worth investigating. Obviously, charge points when they're when they're installed go on the charge point national registry. They will appear on things like ZapMap and things like that. And that kind of relies on you using the technology available to you via your phone or via your car's navigation system. And actually, most people would just tend to look at a road sign to know exactly where they are. Uh, when we install in car parks, charge points and things like that, uh, obviously, we update our signage around those, but that's within the car park itself. Um, so I think it, it's actually a very good question, probably something that you know some people should consider, definitely. Yeah, visibility of where those charges are is so important. Um, yeah. So good, good, good good thought-provoking question and there's um there's another question here mark maybe you can take this one as well uh bit of a difficult one i think but a good 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 thought is is it's asking in your experience does availability and i think this is availability of charges lead to ev use or is it more the other way around that there are more evs therefore you need more charges is like the classic chicken and egg question might be impossible to answer but what are it, your thoughts mark it, it is pretty difficult to answer uh it it's it, it's definitely the kevin costner film build it and they will come type approach and uh you know uh that's certainly one thing that we we look at the infrastructure definitely has to be there to allow 
people to consider making that that move to EV vehicles. Uh, we know it's a always a big concern and a big barrier for anyone thinking about joining and 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 buying or, or leasing an, an electric vehicles. How are they going to charge it? So you definitely need to build the infrastructure first. What I would say with things like column chargers and everything, they're very, very easy to install. So you can put one or two into a street. As you get more utilization, if there is needed, you can put more in more streets. So it, you know, uh, there are ways that we always approach this problem, looking at has there been resident requests, people asking for charges in their street, that sort of thing, working with the local authority that way. Uh, but yeah, my, my personal feeling is generally um, once you start putting them in, people start using them. We can monitor the utilization as that increases and we get more and more demand Then you can put more and more charges in as they're required uh, or do other things, you know, like if you put the charger in and perhaps we don't have so much utilization then we can do things around local marketing, Facebook in local signage on the column to identify that there are charges there, painting green bays, don't necessarily get on the TRO route if we don't need to, because that requires an ongoing enforcement, which is an ongoing cost. So we don't necessarily tend to go down that route, but um, certainly signage and, and markings and putting rebates out will also help encourage people to use those charges that are there. It's not a simple answer. There is no right or wrong way to do it. But I think the easy thing to say is you kind of need to build the infrastructure, hence the need for the Levi funding to kind of allow people to make that decision to move to EVs. I think just yeah, I don't know if you see any, yeah, interested in your thoughts. I think so. My my background used to be much more in the private sector and therefore coming into GFI and actually working really closely with, with Levi. I, I see public subsidy and regulation as a way to try and break that chicken and egg problem. And that's why I think Levi is this fantastic opportunity. And, you know, obviously the regulation being the, the, the 2035 ban, whereas in the private sector, you know, it might be hard to justify or make a project commercially viable without the demand there. So therefore, you know, you see the EVs before you build the infrastructure, because that's, you know, from that's about making a project viable. When you've got public subsidy, when you've got Levi, when you've got the regulation around the ban, actually it provides so much more comfort for that build it and, and they will come. And that's why I think why Levi represents this amazing opportunity at really helping to break that cycle. And I think like Juliet, that's why uh, because it is an opportunity and we can't, I don't think any like any of us in this sector where whichever kind of area you're in we shouldn't presume that levi funding is just going to exist for years and years should we you know so and i suppose that's why if it is an opportunity maybe maybe it will continue for 10 years maybe it will you know maybe it won't maybe, but whatever that window of opportunity we have to take it and that's why the value for money is just so important um so you know because it is to maximize that opportunity isn't it so um I know we're almost at the end of um, the end of the time, and there were lots more. There were lots more questions that we didn't get to, and uh, there are some very good uh, points. Someone saying that the poll was a bit simplistic, and yes, I, I, like so, uh, I hold my hand up for that. I sort of almost wanted it to encourage some conversation, which I think it did, and we saw that actually value for money is is more is more complex and has far more angles and a quick than a easy kind of number of charge points times their power output um but what we will do is there are also some questions you know maybe like where can i find documents and other things so we will make sure that we get back to people on those afterwards um but yeah i would just like to say um you know Thank you very much to Mark and Juliet for joining us. Thank you for everybody else dialing in. I think we're going to put another poll up now, um, which is just a quick poll to say, you know, if um, if you do want Ubertristi to get in touch with you, you know, we can follow up. Um, so, yeah, that's fantastic. Like I said, thanks to everyone for joining. I'm really glad, Juliet, that your voice 
blasted out through the whole thing. You were loud and clear. Uh, and thanks, Mark, for your time. Um, and at Ubertricity, we really look forward to seeing how Levi develops and how these tenders uh, come in and looking to see you know, how we can help the whole sector to grow, um, especially for that on-street charging. So thanks everyone for joining uh, and have a great day.